So we are in two dimensions, which is great. Imagine what even today is a prerequisite for doing field theory, you know, real problems that real people do. And what we'll understand today in more detail is that when we have some nonlinear system here, you know, picture that some kind of curved surface of the values of a field so that is ground here and blades of grass are growing on it. This is the surface of their tips. And if you're, and this has actually happened to me, if you're in South Dakota and you're in a wheat field, it's the ocean. It's a flat earth. It goes forever. It's totally amazing and beautiful in a strange way. So it looks like this, like this yellow field. And uh, in the last lecture, we learn how to live in this flat world, one linear world. But our problems almost always are nonlinear, even when the masquerade is being linear. So now we will dip into nonlinear world again, but in two dimensions. And the main tool, modern tool, since Poincaré about understanding these things is uh, when you're given an equation of which we'll work out few examples today, describing evolution of initial condition or states in state space. If you can draw it, it'll help you a great deal. Now, in this course, we're in one, two, and three dimensions almost always. So it'll be possible to draw everything. And it's helpful because system that we will study are actually reasonable approximations to systems you encounter in biology or chemistry or physics. And uh, but, you know, they have some quirks. So the quirk of one dimensional world is that once you were given marching orders to go in some direction, you could only move in that direction. And the only thing you could do is you could fall in a hole, which is called an attractor, or uh, you could run off to infinity. Now in two dimensions, uh, one looks at state space as a two-dimensional plane, and that's very easy for us to visualize. Now, physicists tend to call this plane phase plane for historical reasons because they came to it by looking at oscillations or harmonic oscillators that you know run in circles and have phases. Most dynamical systems don't look like that, but the word is one of the words that's being used. So a two-dimensional nonlinear system remember this is a differential equation course in disguise. Dynamical systems can be formulated in another way, but this is what we are doing here. You have two velocity or vector fields telling you how your state moves in your state space. So it's a a uh, field of same dimension as state space itself, in this case, has two components. And each component, depending on your problem, might have its own law, but that will depend on where you are in the whole state space. So here is one way you can write it. You can say, I have x, 1, 2, 3, to d dimensions of fields, and now I have as many components of velocity field. And uh, if you like vector notation, which is more convenient, you can think of this as vector of d components, in this case, too. And now this f, which in Kerr's book I call V for velocity, but lots of people like to write F for function, something here. Looks like that. 
So that's what we are facing. And what have we learned so far when we have a problem? Well, what we have learned so far is to say, let me first figure out where are the points where nothing happens, counterintuitively interesting dynamics, but actually finding points where nothing happens is very useful. So this book calls such points fixed points. Uh, I prefer to call them equilibria, but for reasons explained elsewhere. And what I have in mind is when you have like inverted pendulum and you put it vertically up, you have an equilibrium solution where there is no motion. Or if you hang it down, that's another equilibrium. One is stable, one is unstable. So for me, for continuous flow, this is a very intuitive way to think of this. And they are defined as the values in state space, so points in state space, for which there is no velocity, this function, which is a vector field is zero. <laughs> Then what we saw before in one dimension, if we decide to, instead of one dimensional line, which is continuum, we roll it onto itself and make a circle. That's also continuum, but it's compact. It has finite distance before you come back. Uh, in two dimensions, nothing prevents you from finding solutions in which you start someplace and you come exactly back. They also have various names depending who uses them in what context. This is a pretty descriptive name. It says these are orbits that, you know, after a while they close. I like to be more precise and call them periodic orbits. So these are things that have a property that when I solve this equation, so when I look at x at time t, which is the period that come exactly where I started from, x at zero. Then we learn a few more things that will go into two and higher dimensions. The one thing was to, you know, think very coarsely of qualitatively what can happen. And that I will loosely refer to as topology. So these are kind of shapes that can be explored by uh, solutions of dynamical equations. And sometimes there are good reasons why you cannot change parameters in initial condition and change a shape into a totally different shape, you know. Uh, so that's very powerful mental tool to work with these things. And then there is a very specific and explicit thing, which is called stability. So once you find a solution, you would like to know, is that solution where you fall into it this time? Is that solution where you go away? But you also know, like to know, do I do it very fast? Or uh, So you like to have a number about it, and that number can be obtained. And uh, we will do, for linear systems, there was a matrix A, two by two matrix and eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that object are very important. So the idea is basically that if I have a point in state space, and again, I draw it in a plane, but it'll be true every place, then the velocity, this vector here, you know, point someplace with certain strength, meaning how fast you move.
And then that's discussed in the book, but I will not do it in this lecture. It's pretty obvious stuff. You stick it on your computer and you realize that the way you get trajectories by adding small steps, you know, Euler was the simplest example, but Runge could is smarter or something like that. And you have future where you go and you have a past. And you might have come from an unstable fixed point, just to be very specific. And this fixed point might have also things that fall into it. So it's a saddle. You learn the linear version. And pretty soon you realize when you draw this on the paper, there are very few things that can happen when you draw it. Because in determinism, everybody has unique history and unique past, I mean, future and unique past, which means that there is no point in which I'm moving, you know, this equilibrium are very special, but there is no point where I'm in motion. And suddenly I don't know where I'm supposed to go seven kilometer per hour this way or 13 meters per hour this way at an instant. At any given point, I have unique instruction set, which means that these trajectories cannot cross themselves. I'll come to that. So. Our first task is find fixed points. So not to you know, waste time on lots of indices, let's call first component X, second component Y of two dimensional state space. And the velocity, let's give them two names, function F of X and Y and function G the one that's going to give me the Y component, the second component, X or Y. And fixed point condition is actually two conditions, right? Because you have two variables in state space and there are magical values, none, one, two, you know, continuous line of them that depends on the system on which this function is zero. So this is one function number, but also the other one has to be zero. It's very easy to have situation where one component is zero, but the other one is not. It has no uh, you know, geometrical topological meaning because you are moving, it is just accidental that you coordinate a crossing zero. So the, First idea, which is very natural to people in science, is to say is that these laws are smooth. And um, if I'm on a flat Earth, I should be able to describe my neighborhood in terms of deviations from the important point in this case, the neighborhood is nailed down like a butterfly with a needle. It's nailed down by its fixed point. So you want to study deviations from the fixed point. In other words, instead of using X, whatever is your lab coordinate system, you want to translate. So your origin of your coordinates is at the fixed point x dot. And then uh, to describe small neighborhood, you add to it a little number in magnitude compared, you know, what it means is actually a little bit tricky, but a small number. And you do the same thing for the y component. And now what you are actually doing is when you go, when you change from this X, Y coordinates, you're changing to the neighborhood of fixed point, And uh, you assume that it's a small, arbitrarily small neighborhood. 
whenever that happens, you might want to do a Taylor expansion because your law f and g is supposed to be smooth, so it has derivatives. In other words, when I replace x by this quantity, this is just a number, like you know, fixed point at seven, so its derivative is zero. Derivative of number is zero. So I'm looking at derivatives of the two components of velocity, and they're being evaluated slightly off the fixed point. And uh, same thing for G, it's uh, being evaluated the same. Uh, slightly displaced point. And now this is a function I can take derivatives respect to first component and uh, write it as Taylor series. So I can say this is same as setting and same thing with the second component, as setting uh, u and v to zero is the first term. That's the center from which I'm Taylor expanding. Then I can take derivative of function f. Now, f is velocity. It's a vector field that describes velocity of state space. And uh, taking a derivative respect to space coordinate that's called a gradient. So I think of all these guys as velocity gradients. And if you have the law defined at every point, uh, you obviously have the velocity gradient, so there's no problem of finding them either analytically or numerically. And that's the first term. Now I can also take a derivative with respect to this. So I take derivative with respect to second component and um, evaluate it at a fixed point as you do in Taylor expansions and multiply it by this guy. And of course I can do this for the second component of velocity. And the only thing that changes this is instead of F I have G here, but turns all look the same. And now what I'm really doing is I'm thinking of all these terms at evaluated at the fixed points. So this is something that's linear in deviations and each deviation is multiplied by a number because it's not a function anymore because I'm evaluating it at a fixed point itself. So these things are numbers. And you know, we'll work some examples to show them. And you know, you can fill out everything here as you wish, but that's the spirit of it. So then there are higher order terms to do honest work. You now have to take second order term in U, uh, second order term in V, but also term which is first order in U and V, but uh, is a product of two, so it's second order in terms of products, and so on. And you can do that, and you can get a tower of equations, which are called many things, but they're basically transport equation for the systems. So that, what that says is that, you know, instead of writing this in terms of functions, sometimes I can find that there's a natural center for my problem. And then I can expand all my equations around that center. 
But the wonderful thing is that if you just keep the linear term, you get lots of mileage out of it, amazing amount of mileage. So the linear term, what I can do is I can write it this way. I can say, you know, UV So the velocity vector is two components, in general, D components, is, this is linear, so this is just a matrix multiplying U and V, so it's some matrix, which will conveniently, conventionally use letter A to describe it, times U plus V, and then there is stuff that uh, I might or might not have to take care of, And when you start looking at the non-leading terms, what you will discover is, you know, what you mean by the small. So as long as contribution from the, this linear matrix is numerically much, much larger than squares of these quantities, I'm in a linear regime, and then there's some boundary where they start competing and I have to include the higher terms. But for much of what we need, linearism is perfectly good. And what is this matrix? You know, we wrote its components. So it's a matrix that depends on a fixed point. It will be different at every fixed point. And what it is, is these four guys written as a matrix, right? So it's... And uh, this, these derivatives are functions because the derivative of function is a function, but then you evaluate it. So particle line at the fixed point. Now, once they're evaluated, this is just four numbers. So this is just a matrix. I call this matrix And some of my honorable colleagues call this matrix of velocity gradients. Uh, this is a long word. So I use the descriptive word that says this is stability matrix. Because as you saw in our discussion of linear stability, it's, it's eigenvalues that describe the stability. Now, there is a tradition, unfortunately very good people use this notation as well. Uh, it's not something I can blame Strogatz for, to call this Jacobian matrix. My problem with teaching you this is that I actually work in this field, so I have opinions. And, you know, this is unfair to everybody, and it's very confusing to use the term. So when Jacobi, a German mathematician, invented his matrix, which looks like that, except it's not velocities up here, but Jacobi matrix core compares the neighborhood in new coordinates to neighborhood in all coordinates. You have seen it in calculus uh, as a determinant of Jacobi matrix called Jacobian. Uh, so it's a dimensionless thing. It's length over length. Now, this object is not dimensional less because this is velocity, so it has dimension length over time. This is x. So, you know, so this has dimension of one over time. And the uh, Jacobian matrix does something totally different. So that's why I insist on this velocity gradient. And I'll give you a link to Carol's book if you care to do this. 
And regrettably, often you'll see the Jacobian. Now, this happens because nonlinear dynamics is shared by almost all of quantitative science, you know, from economics to uh, neuroscience to fluid dynamics to, uh, you know, aeronautics, all kinds of things. And, you know, everybody gives the names to things as they see fit. And uh, there's lots of specialization. So this book is written by people and for people who have only looked basically at fixed points, <laughs> what they call fixed points, or I call it equilibrium. Now, when you have to do a very general picture that covers from field theory to, you know, chemistry, quantum field theory, you have to have consistent terms. And that's why I cannot possibly call this Jacobian because something else that does show up is Jacobian. And it should show up in this course, but it's kind of shows up later. So much for moralizing. I want to move to a very cute application, uh, which is very much motivating for Strogatz in his own education and his, uh, you know, kind of applications of nonlinear dynamics which is the issue of rabbits versus sheep. Or other people call this population dynamics. But basically, you know, a first very simple, very qualitative discussion of how my colleagues in many, many different laboratories and fields uh, in Howe Building and on the campus and in this planet uh, make models of things that they would like to understand, but they want to cast it in a mathematical language. So the idea is there is a field. It has a fence around it, so it's a limited size field. And I put some sheep into that enclosure and some rabbits jump into that enclosure. So now what's going to happen? Now, if there are only rabbits or only sheep, we would know what happens because, you know, if there's only one kind, they're alone, you know, for each what would happen is that in the beginning, and rabbits, the number of rabbits will be uh, a continuum. These are a lot of rabbits, so we are approximated by continuum number X and continuum number Y. So, um, what would happen is, you know, I put some rabbits in, they start munching, and after a while, they get to this position is that if they munch too much, they will die out, so they cannot grow forever. So they get to the balance of, you know, what environment offers them, how fast the grass grows versus how uh, they munch, and that's called carrying capacity. And we already discussed it uh, in one dimensional case for one variable. It was called logistic equation. Uh, and, you know, it's the same kind of equation, both for sheep and rabbits, but constants are different because sheep eat more. So there'll be fewer sheep that can survive in the same field, but alone there will be just one or other's population in the most naive way of thinking, reaching an equilibrium between grass growing and the, uh, this population consuming it in some balanced way. Now, you put them together. So rabbit tries to eat sheep, but uh, the grass, but then sheep comes by and, you know, shoves him away. Not just him. So now they're together and you have to figure out, you know, how do they survive or not survive together? And here is the simplest uh, idea. So if there are very few rabbits and very few sheep, 
on a big, big field, they can ignore each other because, you know, it's rare that uh, a sheep will run into a rabbit. So what happens is that um, there is uh, some equation called logistic equation. We wrote it before, you know, uh, number of sheep has to be positive. And if there are no sheep, there will be nothing happening. So there is automatically a fixed point. There is a factor x or y that says when either x or y was zero, that's it. There will be no growth. And then you have to put growth rate. Now, rabbits are very prolific and famed for their um, lovemaking or scortatory abilities. So they have some rate which is larger than, than the corresponding thing. So while the number of sheep doubles, you know, number of uh, rabbits triples, except it's written in terms of exponentials, but that's the spirit of it. And they both obey logistic equation, which says at some point, you know, this term starts damping me out. And I have a zero at a three or two. So I have this parabola that you have seen already. But now we have to account for the fact that if I have rabbits and if I have sheep, then there is an interaction term, which will assume it's proportional to density uh, you know, number of rabbits or sheep per, per you know, hectare. And uh, so I will also lose out because I'm trying to eat grass as a rabbit, but the sheep kicks me out, so I get less grass. And sheep does it with some frequency. And, you know, these coefficients are totally arbitrary just to get you a model. In real modeling, you'll try to experimentally uh, get the right order of magnitude for all the coefficients. And same thing happens to, to sheep, you know. When they run into a rabbit, rabbit is eating their grass, so that's decreasing it. But, you know, a rabbit is not as important as a sheep, so it's a smaller factor. So here is the simplest rabbits versus sheep equation. It has several terms to it. So the first term is when there are very few of them, there are growth rates. So if you have some bacteria on a substrate and a sheep, you know, you can start with few and you can measure the time in which number of bacteria doubles in the beginning, you get an exponential growth. You always get that because all these linear problems have exponential solutions. But uh, we have to account for saturation in given for given carrying capacity. That's called logistic equation. And then we have to uh, account for interaction. And you know, more realistic models, we have more terms and things will start looking pretty ugly because you'll have to account for more and more phenomenology. So when people tell you about, you know, gene expression or bunch of chemicals together or many other interesting biological settings, you'll get a tower of these equations uh, for different chemicals. We will even show you in the course one of these examples where you have 27 chemicals and you get interesting dynamics. So they'll get Big, but here is the spirit of it, you know. There is something you can measure for low density of them, so there are parameters you can get. 
you can uh, measure the world without other guys interfering. So you can get pretty good logistic equation kind of things. And then you'll make assumptions that the interaction is proportional to density and how likely they are to meet each other. That that linearly increases with either densities or bilinear densities. But if you are doing a problem in, a, you know, on a graphene on a lattice or something, you might discover that you know left running or right running rabbits are the same. So you might have to have some powers imposed to you by symmetry. We saw this in picture bifurcations, but this is the general strategy. So that's how you make a model. And that's probably the simplest, you know, credible model I just reported from Strogat's book. Then you're told, uh, find fixed points. And you know, in general, it's work, but here you can all do it by inspection. So if X and Y are zero, obviously the right hand side is zero, so that's a fixed point. So there's one fixed point there. Then you can decide that one of these guys is zero. So if Y is zero, then there is a fixed point when X equals three. If X is zero, then there's a fixed point when y is, you know, this goes away, this goes away uh, where y equals two. So only had three fixed points without any work whatsoever. And then there could be more, and it depends on orders of these terms. You can even count how many maximal number of zeros because you can reduce this in polynomials just in one of these variables in the usual way where you solve for set of polynomial equations. And you're not guaranteed that you can get all the fixed points as real fixed points, but in complex plane, there is a fundamental theorem algebra that enables you to always count the number of fixed points. So this fixed point problem is fairly simple. So what I've already told you, let's just write it. So I told you one fixed point is when x equals zero, it's this guy, two minus y. So, well, the first one was obvious, you know, if both are zero, that's a fixed point. It'll sit someplace in phase space, but you know where it sits, it sits at the origin of this, uh, X, Y plane. Then there was when X was zero and Y equals two, X equals zero means on this line. So there is a fixed point here. Then there was Y was zero, but X then also could have a zero here. So that's three points here. That's this three here. And then you have to do a little more. But when you look at these equations, you know, they were designed to be pedagogical. So if I set X and Y equal one, then this is three minus one minus two, that's zero. Two minus one minus one, that's zero. So it turns out that it's another fixed point at 1.1, usually just solve this equation, that's easy to solve. So then our list says, okay, but uh, when you have fixed points, you want to know what happens in their neighborhoods. So you must do their stability. And remember, stability was this matrix. Linear stability. So there is a matrix that we have to find. It's two by two matrix in this case. In general, it's D by D matrix. And it's a set of differentials of functions evaluated at certain points. So it'll be you know, a matrix of functions of gradients of velocities. 
So the first one with respect to X, right. The first one with respect to Y, second one with respect to X, second one with respect to Y. And now in lots of experiments, observations, modeling of economic systems, etc. This this has to be measured because you don't have a good theory. But in our childishly simple examples, which is typically what theoretical physicists work with, you actually have polynomial expressions for lost fields, and you know how to take derivatives of polynomials. So derivative of this guy with respect to x is you know, 3 minus 2x, this is x squared, minus 2y, 3 minus 2x minus 2y. That was just taking the real with respect to x. If I take the real with respect to y, there's only one term, it's minus 2x. If I take the derivative with respect to x of this, there's only one term, it's minus, you know, y times x, so this is minus y. And then there is a mixed up term that is 2, that is minus the derivative of square, which is 2y. So that is 2 minus 2y. And the derivative with respect to y of this term is minus x. So usually you have this, right now it's in functional form, so it's very cute, but maybe you're not so lucky. But usually you can evaluate this matrix of velocity gradients. Now that you have it as a function in this particular application, you go back to your list of fixed points and write down the corresponding matrices. So evaluate this for x equals zero, y equals two. So x equals zero, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, and y equals two, this is three minus four, so that's minus one. Uh, this has been set equal to zero. Down here, minus y, it's two, so it's minus two. And here I have two minus times minus, so that will get minus two minus four. So that's one of these guys. And now I can do it every place. At the origin, you know, x and y are set equal to zero, so only three and two survive. At the other axis where x, y is zero, but x is three, you can see here you get minus six, y is zero, so it gets zero. And then this uh, adds up to minus three. And this adds up to minus one. Or oh, x is three. So it's two minus x, so it's minus one. I'm, I'm good, I didn't make an error. And finally, you have a guy here where I said both x and y equal to 1. So this is 3 minus 2 minus 2. So that's minus 1. This is minus 1. This is minus 2. And they have a 2 minus 1. 
This is minus one. Great. So now, uh, why do we need these stability vectors? One thing we can see from them immediately, these are upper diagonal matrices. Well, here it's obvious, the eigenvalues of this matrix, because it's diagonal matrix, it's three and two. That means that this matrix uh, corresponds to expansion by e to the factor three uh, in the x direction and e to the factor two in the, so it's unstable in both directions, but it's slower along this diagonal in the y direction. And what that will mean is that uh, my trajectory kind of start tangentially out and go this way, moving vertically, because both X and Y are growing, but uh, you know this one is going much faster, much slower than this one. So that's what that looks like. Then you have to do the same story here. You can see that eigenvalues are minus one, minus two, and uh, because it's upper triangle, these are the eigenvalues. So that means that this thing is attractive. That's why I draw a black dot here. Same thing happens here. The eigenvalues are minus three, minus one, and this is attractive. And here, right now, I don't know because it's a matrix. So I don't know what its eigenvalues are. So let's just work out this example. So this matrix has two eigenvectors. But the important one is the one that's slow. You know, contraction is slower than uh, contraction in the y direction. I mean, in y direction, what happens is I go, you know, every time I contract by some factor in x direction, I contract by the square of that in the y direction, so I contract much more strongly. So the important eigenvector is this one. And what is that? So I'll use the eigenvalue to label V and V is the eigenvector. Now, you know, usually it's work, but in this childish example, you can see what it is. Uh, if I multiply A, by uh, minus one, etc. I will get from here. Uh, I'll get minus one. If I multiply it down here, I'll get four times one of one. So it turns out that this is an eigenvector. Could have done it other ways. Well, actually, let me do it because this is too clever. Let me do it. So we are looking at a fixed point where x equals zero, so it's sitting on a y-axis. It's up at value two, and we we'll look at the eigenvalue equals minus one. There were two eigenvalues, right? There was eigenvalue minus one, minus two, but the one that's a laggard is the one that we see. Uh, you can do both if you want to, but you'll find out that's the main qualitative behavior is there. And we are solving the eigenvalue equation, which is this matrix of velocity gradients multiplied by a two component vector that we are trying to figure out called eigenvector should return eigenvalue, this one minus one, times the same eigenvector. So now I can put this on the left hand side, and uh, this will be on the diagonal if I write as a matrix. So it will cancel when I put it here, the, this will cancel, minus one to minus one will cancel. 
Now this will be plus one minus two, so that'll be that. Of diagonal guys don't get changed. And I find out that my eigenvector has to satisfy the equation this equals zero. I put it on the right side. And I just look at it. And you know, this one gives me no information because vector multiplied by zero is zero. So that's obviously has to do with the other eigenvector. But if I write here one and minus two, that will clearly give me zero. So the eigenvector is only defined up to overall factors. The only thing that matters is really ratio in this case of components. But you can just read of this eigenvector. And now you can go back and you can draw it. So it's an eigenvector that's, you know, <coughs> has, if you go in X by one, you go down by minus two. So it's kind of at an angle smaller than 45 degrees, right? It's, it's kind of more vertical and horizontal. And now we know that if I'm on this line, I'll get in the fixed points. Uh, the neighbors will be all kind of sucked in in this direction. So the flow in this neighborhood will look like that. Now, working out, this guy is the same, except instead of having two, you have three and da da da. So that's, I won't do it for you because it's really very simple. You'll find out that the eigenvector having to do with uh, minus, uh, minus one, the slower one, is three minus one. So it's a thing that's sort of horizontal this way. And the neighbors are flowing in in the same way as neighbors tend to do. So locally the flow looks like that. And because it's negative, negative, this is a sink. It's a contracting, attracting point. Now this is a calculation, but it's calculation you know how to do. So it says, Take A to be minus one, minus two, minus one, minus one. That's this thing here. And this has a trace, which is a sum of elements on the diagonal, which is minus two. And this matrix also has a determinant. So these are two numbers associated with it. Product on this diagonal is plus one. Product on this diagonal is two. You have to subtract them and you get minus one. And therefore, I know it's eigenvalues. There are two, there are plus and minus. Uh, the first term is trace divided by two, so that gives me minus, plus minus one half. Then I have the so-called discriminant, the square root thing, where I take the trace and square it, and I subtract four times the determinant, which is minus one. And this is four, this is four goes out, and I get minus one plus minus square root of two. Now square root of two is larger than one, so this is a saddle. It has an eigenvalue which is positive and an eigenvalue which is negative. So which way do the eigenvectors go? You know, there's an unstable eigenvalue. We'll call lambda plus. There is a stable eigenvalue. We'll call it lambda minus. And now I have to solve the same equation as before. So remember what I did is I moved, when I was doing it, you know, I moved this term on left-hand side, subtracted on diagonal, 
to get a condition or kind of null which way v points to be to get the null if you, null if you wish. And the same calculation now gives me uh, the one cancels when I subtract it from left hand side. I just get the square root of two for plus eigenvalue, this is minus two. This doesn't change. And down here, I have, again, same thing as up here. And I have to find eigenvector that multiply, this gives me zero. And again, in this case, you just look at it and say, well, you know, if I take it square root of two and minus one, then square root of two times square root of two will give me two with a minus sign. And minus two times minus one, zero. So that's obviously the eigenvector. You do the same thing for the contracting direction. That should be zero. And look at it in so well, you know, of has to be square root of two is plus sign here. So these are two eigenvectors of the problem. And now I go back and I draw them on my little diagram. So the stable one has a property that both components are positive. So stable one is looks something like this. And you know it's attractive from both sides. Unstable one is you go this way, but then you go down, so it's pointing down. And then of course it's a line and it's repelling on both sides. So that's what the neighborhood looks like. So now I have topological information says these are the fixed points. But now I have a bit of, you know, geometric information, metric information that says in their neighborhoods, the linearized motion is of the kinds we studied on Tuesday. But basically, there is a repelling point, there are two attracting points, and there is a saddle point. And they sit in a space. And now you can just draw the face plane of the problem. Remember, this was all about the rabbits. So I'm counting rabbits, I call their number X, or the you know density of rabbits per per hectare of the field. This is X or rabbits. This is sheep. On this plot, I had a fixed point at the origin. No sheep, no rabbits, nothing happens. That's obviously a fixed point. Then the world in which there were no rabbits. There was a logistic world and it always says the extra fixed point of logistic equation. And because rabbits were multiplying faster, you know, this was a two, but for rabbits, this guy was actually three. So these are two attractive fixed points in the world when there are only sheep or only rabbits. And that was what logistic equation gives us. You know, we start with any number of sheep in a given field. I get to the point where uh, the number of sheep dies out <laughs> uh, unless uh, you know, I, I, I'm in the optimal balance between the two. And then there's you know an extra guy because these are nonlinear problems. They have can have fixed points any place. 
So in this case, there is an extra guy it happens to be here, and it's a saddle point. And now uh, I know a little bit about their neighborhoods. So I know that in this neighborhood, you know, everybody starts out this way. So maybe take green. And now in the world of sheep, the rabbits, uh, you know, if there are a few rabbits, there are a little bit of perturbation. But basically what happens is that I go from repeller to there is this attractor. And there is this attractor in linear approximation. I knew what they were. So I just uh, go this way and I end up. Uh, as though there were no rabbits. But turns out on this side, if I start out on this side, you know, of this uh, eigenvector, it's as though there were never sheep. They produce, you know, a little bump, but sheep go away and I end up with only rabbits. And then you say, well, but you know, if I start someplace in between, you know, here I'm going to the left, here I'm going to the right, so something must separate them. And indeed, there is a curve which ends up on the, in this little neighborhood, ends up on the eigenvector that attracts in, into this subtle point. And that actually also, you know, I can start where we have any number of rabbits and sheep, too many for the field to sustain them, so their number will be falling down. But in the neighborhood, they will come in this way. And this is called a separate tricks. It separates the world where the sheep win from the world where the rabbits win. Then, there is a special line here. This is the unstable eigenvalues, this guy here. And, uh, you know, this line and everybody on this end ends up being shipped. So this, there'll be a continuous thing here. So this is called unstable manifold. It's called manifold because it's curved, and in higher dimension, it's curved in many dimensions, so in manifold. So on this side, there is a line in which, you know, you end up from saddle into stable point, and there is one shortest line where you end up in this saddle point. And now everybody else on this side will end up there. On this side, we'll end up there. And anybody below the stable manifold will, uh, you know, believe that he or she is being attracted in the stable direction, then discover that actually this is a saddle. So when I pro approach it, it pushes me away in this direction. Okay. So I'll end up doing stuff like that. The whole neighborhood is an unstable manifold, including the edges, right? Okay. Because everybody is here, everybody is being repelled here, everybody is being attracted. So uh, it doesn't have interesting structure. It has a line of fastest attraction. Well, this is slowest attraction and everybody else falls in faster. Okay. Same thing here. And the interesting stuff is, of course, the saddle point, and that'll be what will lead to chaos eventually. There'll be uh, this idea that, you know, there are these points in uh, fixed points in a world that kind of say, come, 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 because I'm very attractive. And once you get close, they kick you away. And indeed, in previous chapter, 
I avoided it, but you can read it. Strogatz has a section called Love. And, you know, it's one of those things about uh, attraction or repulsion. Uh, so you can model dating services this way. But, but the important feature here is that this line, you cannot cross it because you're not allowed. These are all trajectories and trajectories cannot cross. I'll, I'll come back to that. I have a little bit of time. So this is actually a, a boundary. And we tend to call it basin boundary because, in, you know, this has to do with ge geology, whether water from the mountains goes. Everybody, if you start with any population of sheep and rabbits, which is below this curved line, nonlinear, stable manifold. The outcome will be only rabbits. If you start above this basin boundary, the outcome will be only sheep and the population people give this a name, this phenomenon, they call it competitive exclusion. And now, you know, this is done in a very crude way, this model. So there are many, many things in other environments which interact in other ways. And uh, there are many good models in which you reach coexistence of the species. And they're even more interesting in that because you'll find that coexistence is a fluctuating coexistence. It's not just a stupid... Uh, boring things. But anyway, so this is a rabbit basin of attraction between, you know, any number of rabbits and sheep and zero sheep, this line. Basin. And the rest of the world is all owned by sheep and I won't color it, but you, you get the idea. So that's a very good example of what much of analysis will go like. And it arise, relies very strongly on being a two-dimensional problem. So it'll turn out a lot of things that look sensible here in three dimension won't work because you know the basin boundary that just line in three dimensions so you'll be able to hop over it or come underneath and do crazy stuff called chaos. But in two dimensions, there is no chaos. You just, that's all you get. Now, using, getting this, I uh, assumed something which is obvious, but, you know, has to be proven. So it's proven in books on differential equations. And that is existence and uniqueness. So the idea of existence as uniqueness is that if you have a state space point, and you have some neighborhood of it in any dimension, doesn't have. We already did it in one dimension, but you know, easiest to draw two dimensions or three. But uh, what happens is that there is an open neighborhood, meaning you know I can come close to the boundary as much as I want to without being on it, so it's open neighborhood. And my velocity field is sufficiently smooth every place in here that I can de you know, uh, define at least one derivative usually and need few more. And in our application, we assume all derivatives can be computed. So if there is an open neighborhood where I have derivative, I can uh, have at least finite part of past and finite past of future. And in the beginning, of course, we gave you examples of blow ups and stuff like that where things cannot be defined, but in open neighborhood, they can be defined. And one thing that's verboten is so that's existence i can solve the equation but what's verboten is a german i'm sorry 
forbidden. What's forbidden is uh, the possibility that I stand someplace and I get, you know, as a soldier, I really don't want to be in this situation. I get two sets of instructions. You know, somebody says your vector field is moved to the right, and somebody says your vector field is, well, you have to go up in three steps to the right. And uh, that means that I would have two trajectories by this thing, and they would intersect. I would get to the point where I don't know what I'm doing, and that's uh, not allowed. So the main thing about uniqueness, what's meant by uniqueness, is that trajectories do not intersect. So this is not allowed. Once you're in that situation, then your analysis of any dynamical system, you get something like this because you get fixed point. But in two dimension, there's another thing that can happen, which is very important. So if I solve my equation of motion, so I look at my trajectory, and I'm looking at what happens as time goes to infinity. For example, it's an atomic system, and I want to know what happens after 10 to the 12 times electron goes around the hydrogen. So some large number, which I can take to infinity. Then I know one possibility is fixed point. But in two dimensions, there's another one which is called, in this book, limit cycle. And I prefer to call it periodic orbit. And I prefer to call this guy stable and the idea of the stable orbit is that, you know, if I'm not going to fix point, what else can happen? You know, I'm moving in a plane, I'm not allowed to cross myself. Whenever I come back, I, you know, I can't cross, I can't cross, I can't cross. So now a possible solution is that I do this and I approach a periodic orbit, which is forward in time, a limit cycle. I also can have an unstable orbit. Which people who like computers, you know, never see unless they're looking for it. And in my world, this is equally likely or even more likely than periodic orbits. So chaos is all about unstable orbits. Order is all about stable orbits or limit cycles. So what's an unstable orbit? It's an orbit, if you're on it, you come back after the finite time by integrating your runge kuta integrator. But if you're a little bit off it, then you come back further away off it because you're not allowed to cross further away and you run away. And this is now basically all that can happen in two dimensions. And from it, we have explored one part of it, but we will also explore this other part.